evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths in Conversation, episode number eight. It is my great honour and pleasure, indeed, to welcome to the library tonight, Bob Quinn. And Bob, if you don't mind me giving you a tiny bit of an introduction, uh, Bob is very well known in Ireland for his... Uh, uh, somewhat controversial, but nevertheless fascinating and very interesting uh, view on the origins or some of the origins of our, our culture uh, in history and in prehistory. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, he uh, was in pri primarily, primarily involved in uh, a documentary or a series of documentaries called Atlantean, Following on from that, he published his book, The Atlantean Irish, in 2005, and that will be the focus of this evening's conversation, um, and I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Bob, you're very welcome along, and uh, I should, first of all, do what I always do at the very beginning, which is to ask you to tell us a little bit about your background, and there was something specific in that uh, I believe that you may have origins in the East and you ended up in the West. And I wondered what you found so attracting, attractive about the West, given that you were a dub. Yeah, I was born in Dublin a long, long, long time ago um, in a place called Crumnall and uh, moved to Rathgar, which was a very posh place, but we weren't very posh. And uh, the difference between the two places that you say was in Crumnall, they kept their coal in the, in the bath. And in Rathgar, sex was what you carried your coal in. Uh, very class conscious they were in those days. And uh, I, I grew up beside a river, the Dodder, Owen Dutra, which I think is a pre-Celtic name now to anticipate our later conversation. And uh, beside a river, beside trees and spent the summer swimming in the Dodder and uh, the winter climbing trees and in the spring looking for birds nests and robbing orchards and it was like living it was Rusi Nurbe it was like living in the country we were in the countryside really in the suburbs of Dublin and it was an idyllic uh, place to live uh, I miss it still and whenever I go to Dublin which is not often I always drive down to just drive around it and remind myself of this Idyll. Oui. And uh, that's, uh, that's my origins anyway. I'm a dub, basically. But I've been living here for 50 years in Connemara, so I'm uh, only probably a half dub by now. In fact, I'm more Connemara than Dublin by now. I think you have to be living in, in Drogheda for several generations before you're considered anything other than a blow-in. Yeah, um, well, that's the same with me here. After 50 years, I'm still a stone chair. Tell us how, what, when was your first, when, when did you first visit Connemara and, and how did it captivate you? Oh, in, uh, when I was young, uh, I was interested in uh, mountains. And so a few of us used to drive down every Friday evening to Connemara, to Lean Ann, and climb the mountains there for the weekend. Lovely. And uh, when I was 19, actually, a pal of mine had a little motorbike and we toured Ireland on this motorbike and we ended up in Connemara in Letter Mullen. And I remember we went for a swim one day and we brought no food. So I called to a cottage to ask the Dana tea, would she make a couple of sandwiches for us? And she said, no, I can't make sandwiches, but hang on a minute. I mean, I didn't speak Irish at this time. So she disappeared inside and came out with a full untouched gatto cake and handed it to me. And I thought, I've always remembered that. I think that may have convinced me of the generosity of the people I in future came to dwell amongst. Uh, but uh, I liked it. For, I, I mean, I, I, I loved uh, Connemara, the North Connemara, because of the mountains there. And because every weekend, practically in the summer, we'd go down to walk the mountains there and end up in Eddie Hamilton's pub in Binan. And I really, I didn't know anything about the Gaeltacht talk or Connemara. I didn't even know that people spoke, everybody spoke Irish in Connemara. I mean, I knew very little of that, and I had no graw for, I wasn't a Gaelic or at all, and I had uh, school Irish in Sing Street Secondary School, and the brothers used to be Kerry Irish into it, 
And ever since that, I've had great res reservations about Kerry Irish, uh, probably because of that. As, as I developed a love of Connemara Irish, I sort of forgot my interest in Kerry Irish. And I, well, I still find it easy to understand, although I find Tirconnell, uh, uh, Donegal Irish, quite difficult to understand still. But then if I go to Dublin, and I'm in Dublin, the middle of it somewhere, I actually find it hard to understand Dublinese. You know, they speak very yeah. fast like that, you know, no, no, the fuck, what the pain, you know. And uh, it's a bit like that sometimes, or was a bit like that and sometimes in Connemara. In fact, one day I was in a pub in, in Karna and uh, Charles Mitchell was reading the news on RTE, Telefiche Aaron, and uh, he ha had to be taught the words because he had no Irish at all. And it was book Irish. And the barman, who was a native Irish speaker, came up to me and said, what is he saying? <laughs> he didn't understand this Irish. <laughs> So uh, I, I also I discovered there's a big difference between uh, the Irish spoken in Dublin and the Irish spoken in Connemara, where everybody speaks it. Yeah, but you got a nice warm welcome down there anyway. It's not Maybe. often you call to a house and get offered cake. That's yeah. right. And I, sh I should say too that if you're not, those of you who are watching, if you're not familiar with Lean Anne, it is a truly beautiful part of the world. It is one of the most extraordinary landscapes uh, located uh, at uh, Killary Harbour, which is a fjord. And uh, if you haven't seen it and you, you're not able to travel with COVID and everything else, well, if you watch the film The Field with Richard Harris, it is largely set in and around uh, Lean Anne, and you'll get a taste of what is uh, extraordinary landscape. No surprise, Bob, that you should fall in love with the place. Um, myself and my family, we have a connection with it in that, uh, you know, we went there when we were kids and then we saw the field and we fell in love with it even more. Um, when and, and how did you first become interested in the material that would form the basis of the TV series and the book? Yeah, well, when I came to Connemara, I was fascinated, first of all, by the fact that everybody spoke Irish. And second of all, I was fascinated by the music here, which was Shano singing. And I'd, I'd heard it on the radio in my childhood when uh, my father used to switch it off. And uh, it didn't attract me at all, it didn't attract us at all. And, but when I came to Connemara, I realized it was the pop music of Connemara and everybody, not everybody sang it, but most people could sing it, but very few could sing it well. They used to say you can, you can learn it, but you can't be taught it. And I was fascinated by it because when I was young and heard this music on the radio, it, it was like Arabic singing that I heard late night on the radio as well. And it sounded to, like me to Arabic singing. I couldn't understand it. And it had all of these grace notes. It was greatly ornamented, elaborate. And it took great skill to sing it. And I became fascinated by this. And uh, it, I started uh, thinking in terms of uh, the Arabic connection, uh, which was crazy, but uh, because most of North Africa is Berber, not uh, Arabic, uh, although they both speak both Berber and Arabic there. And uh, I started slightly inserting bits into the films I was making, because that's essentially what I was, uh, like uh, having Neil Tobin and, and Donald McCann uh, dancing to, to uh, Arabic music which I put on the radio and nobody noticed the difference. They thought it was channels, I think, but nobody noticed that nobody commented on at all, at all, at all, that this very strange Arabic music was playing in this little cottage uh, set in, in Connemara. And I started uh, making little inserts like that and thinking about it all the time, actually. And um, eventually, and I started reading about it as well and finding out what, what is this thing, Islam? And, what is this place, North Africa, like? And uh, when I went to Morocco for the first time, um, I, I, di I did. I, I loved it as much as I liked Connemara. I, I loved Con I loved Morocco, and I loved the people there. And I was fascinated by it because uh, they were. You know, you'd rarely meet a person who didn't have a mother, at least a Berber. So they were mixed between Arabs and Berbers, and but the Berbers have preserved their language, which I admired as well after 1500 years of takeover by uh, the Arabs and they still speak their language and speak Arabic of course as well. And I found it fascinating the whole place, particularly in the light of my interest in uh, Shanos and Arabic singing. 
was it was it an exotic place to 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 visit back then north africa wouldn't it have been exactly on most people's uh, travel schedules yes well uh, agadir was a tourist place and a lot of irish tourists were there in fact um it's uh, good that you use the word exotic because i actually use that in the films and i'm describing my reactions to uh Connemara when i first came there and i say the first thing i say is Connemara is exotic and it was exotic because it was strange to me dog um and exoticism i was accused of that much later by lilith O'Lear of exoticizing uh, Connemara but it was exotic to me it was strange and new it was a uh, it was like and for the first time i felt like i was living in ireland and the pale was a foreign place i gradually developed that feeling that the pale was a foreign country and that connemara was my own country and that feeling has persisted well i've, I've been here for 50 years and i probably be carried out in a box from it eventually not too soon i hope but uh, eventually i'll drink to that um i i have to agree with you in, in your use of the word exotic it is it is like another country but perhaps it is more like the real country you know yeah. um in the early part of your book you focus on this debate or discussion between charles valency and edward ledwich which i found very interesting it's true because we've spoken about valency on a number of our episodes um you know he gets a very hard time uh, from the point of view of his linguistic studies, uh, in, in fact, I think didn't Ledwidge say of him that uh, he, 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 they were the ravings of a bedlamite and uh, uh, would induce sleep as soporific? I think is how he described it. But there's a bit of a there's an indication that you've a bit of a soft spot for Valency all the same, and yeah. in, this, in this sort of schizophrenia that developed about you know the origins of the Irish and that's always been an area of controversy you seem to come down on Valency's side somewhat is that true or that's true uh, I saw in this debate between Valency and Ledwich uh, a debate that has been going on ever since that was in the 18th century and that debate has been going on ever since uh, essentially are we British or are we Irish now Valency was an Englishman and a military man and an engineer, but he took the trouble of learning Irish. Whereas Ledwich was an Anglo-Irish Protestant. And he was of course on the side of the Anglo-Irish. And so he ridiculed any sort of ancestry, noble ancestry for the Irish. But he, he made terrible, I mean, they were both dealing with very little knowledge uh, but, and Valancy, Valancy uh, postulated that uh, about the, the Phoenicians, etc. And Ledwich claimed that Unabonia, your favorite subject, was built by the Danes in the ninth century AD. So Ledwich was very ignorant, but basically it was, he was criticizing Valancy because Valancy was championing the Irish and attributing to them noble things, whereas uh, um, Ledwich was a classical uh, West Brit, uh, Anglo-Irish West Brit, who taught the local natives who were savages, as most uh, colonists do. They look on the natives as savages and barbarians. And so that's why my sympathy lay with Valancy, even though he's been ridiculed ever since. But I saw the seeds of the dispute in our country that has split us in half for the past couple of centuries. Those of the who, who favor union with Britain and those who uh, stick to a, an individual Irish identity. And I must say I found myself more at home in Connemara because they didn't, they weren't uh, chauvinistic at all. They just spoke the language very naturally and laughed at disputes like this. Uh, that's what I found a great sense of humor here about subjects like that. And so that's why I came down inside of Valancy. And, but that, that particular dispute uh, carried on for years. For instance, the, the scholars of the 19th century agreed really with Valancy. Some of them said that the Irish were Phoenicians 
uh, and I studied the Phoenicians a bit and found out about them, and I developed a, 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 a graph for them uh, because they had come from Lebanon in the 8th century BC, 8th century AD, no, 8th century BC, and they uh, built Carthage on, uh, on the north, on, in Tunisia, what is now Tunisia, and they, but they were great sailors. That's what I liked about them because my thesis was based on the idea of the sea and that Ireland is an island. And so it's been invested with influences from every north, south, east and west. And so influences on our Irish could have come from anywhere around on the compass. And that allowed me to open the door to the maritime connection uh, that was the only thing that connected this island with North Africa and the Mediterranean, the sea, uh, nothing else. And so I followed that trail and I discovered that there, were, there was much traffic between Ireland and North Africa, or between North Africa and Ireland, down through the centuries, as, as recently as the 18th century. And it, it was mainly because of piracy. Uh, piracy was based in Algiers. John de Courcy Ireland wrote extensively on this and he, he taught me a lot about it. And it, it transpired that uh, Baltimore was sacked by uh, pirates from Algiers in the 18th century and 17th century. And they took the entire population of 160 people from Baltimore and brought them back to Algiers as slaves and concubines and members of the harem and everything else. But the irony was, of course, that the residents of Baltimore were not Irish at all. They were English colonists. And so I thought there was a great irony about that. Anyway, those, that piracy went up and down the, the, the Western coast, the Atlantean coasts for years. Yeah, it did. Um, in relation to, um, you know, the argument about our origins, etc. There is a difficulty, isn't there, with this term that I actually try to avoid in my own written work, Celtic. Uh, you know, and there's something about this term that you dislike in its application to Irish culture. Uh, tell us a little bit about why that is. Well, the term Celt came from the Greeks originally. It was Keltoi, K-E-L-T-O-I. And the Greeks used the term to refer to the barbarians beyond the Alps. All of North Europeans were Keltoi, in other words, barbarians, wogs. And uh, so it, it started as a term of abuse. And eventually uh, in 1699, I think, 1700, a man who, the fir very first man who entered Europe, Una Boyne, Newgrange, Edward Lloyd from Oxford, of the Ashmolean uh, Library in Oxford. Um, he was a Welshman originally, and he formulated, the, adopted the term Celts to refer to the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, the Bretons, the Cornish, and said, these are Celts. He overlooked the fact that the term Celtic is purely a linguistic term. It has no basis in race or anything else. Uh, in fact, there's no such thing as race in the first place, except the human race. But So he uh, was a Welsh patriot, chauvinist, if you like, and he lumped us all together in the term Celtic. And that seems to have been the major introduction of the term Celtic to us, even though linguists use the term still, because they have to use some term to refer to the, their common interest, which is the Irish, Welsh, etc., Breton, Basque even. And so it was sort of a, 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 a gathering of mistakes, really, that led to the Irish being called Celts. And of course, now it's purely a, 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 a touristic term and it refers to myths and things like that. You know, it's a, it's a fanciful term. And I dislike it because it's so misapplied. It is purely a, Celt, a linguistic term, like Indo European is a linguist term at all and doesn't relate to peoples at all except that they speak these languages, or so supposed to speak these languages. But the idea that Irish is a Celtic language is, is nonsense. In fact, the term Celt is nonsense. We should drop it. In fact, I've found in recent years that uh, they, I don't find scholars referring to Celtic archaeology anymore. And they used to. Etienne Rin of yeah. UCG always talked about the Celtic and the architecture, Celtic this and Celtic that. And if I may deviate a little, 
two young students from uh, UCG came to me once years ago because they were interested in this idea. And they said they had gone to Etienne Rin, the late Etienne Rin, a nice man, I met him once. And they said to him, could we do our thesis on the archeology span of Connemara? And Etienne Rin said to them, don't bother, there's nothing out there. <laughs> and one of those students was Michael Gibbons, who lives in Clifton for years and has explored Connemara and has discovered an immensity of, of archaeology out here. He has, actually, he has, uh, he's a brilliant field archaeologist. Oh, he's pioneered it. Although he has very controversial views about Newgrange and its reconstruction, over which he and I have clashed. But we, sure. we will not follow that rabbit down that hole, not today anyway. <laughs> um, uh, isn't it interesting though, in relation to Newgrange, that Lloyd was the first to explore it in the modern era, and Valency was the first, I think, to, uh, for not only to, to draw a sort of a decent plan of the monument, but also to suggest that there might be a solstice link there, that these were individuals, I suppose, of influence in, in, their, in their age, who went on to have um, a sort of a lasting effect on these things. So for instance, as you say, Lloyd, formulated the word Celts, and you prefer, I mean, is this, Bob, am I right in saying I get the impression this is why you coined the term Atlantean as a replacement for the idea of the Celt? Exactly, yes. Well, Atlantean refers to the western coasts of Europe and the maritime seaways that go up and down the coast from North Africa to Scandinavia. And it's a, a logical thing. And, the reason why nobody seemed to consider the sea as a link between these faraway places was because they were all landlubbers and they spent their lives in libraries and reading books and reading the precedents of, of previous lazy scholars. Uh, and I think the term Celtic was adopted and used uh, as, a, as a, a, a temptation to avoid thinking for themselves and thinking through the implications of all of these things. So the term Atlantean seems to cover all these bases. It refers to the Atlantic Sea and it refers to the coastal dwellers on the, on the western uh, coasts of Europe from Scandinavia to Morocco. Isn't there a tendency to view the map? If you look at the, the, the map the way we present it with north up, Ireland very much appears not just peripheral but almost isolated way out there on the west um, beyond everything else. But if you turn the map uh, 90 degrees, you have Ireland at the top, as you say, rightly point out, in the center of these, these important sea lanes connecting it's Ireland. It's a traffic island. That's what Ireland is, a traffic island. Scandinavia to the north uh, and Scotland, of course, perhaps even Iceland and, you know, Iberia, France, Iberia, and then, the north coast of Africa and of course once you round the corner through the pillars of Hercules you have endless uh, opportunities there for trade and um, it kind of makes sense doesn't it that um, you know from that point of view that uh, as, as an, an ocean going culture uh, that we saw that as the handiest way to travel and of course that goes all the way back into prehistory when we know that there were fairly organized uh, contributions from the likes of Orkney and, of course, uh, Brittany uh, in the Irish uh, megalithic uh, sphere. Mm. Um, the, the basis of it is, as I said, a traffic island, because uh, there was a, the way that travel in those days was by sea, before planes and, and, and railways. And it was easier to travel by, by sea, uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is one thing that struck me when I came here. The people of Connemara were boat people. Mm. I mean, everybody seemed to have a boat, a row boat, or, and there are three kinds of boats here, the Bodmoor, the Hooper, the middle bo boat, which is the Glocho, and the Pukon, which has a dipping lug sail, which was invented by the Arabs in the 13th century. And I sailed one of these uh, Pukons down from Terre Island long, many years ago, all the way down to Valencia with one sail and a dipping lug, which it, could adapt itself to any direction of the wind. And I remembered that voyage and I said, that's the way they travel. 
with dipping loaves in small boats to people who came up here. Sorry, was that Valencia or Valencia? Valen Valencia in Kerry. In Kerry. <laughs> oh, well, you wouldn't go to Valencia. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Um, only one sail and an uh, outboard boater. Had you not sailed before then, before, like, obviously, in Dublin, you never had an interest in sailing? No, sailing was for rich people in Dunleary. Yeah. I had never, well, I went out a couple of times with pals of mine, but uh, no, I wasn't a sailor at all. In fact, I was just a swimmer. I wasn't a sailor at all. I had no interest in sailing until I came here and I saw everybody was obsessed with boats. And every Sunday, there was a, a, there was a, a collection of the hookers and glochos and pukons. Every Sunday, there was a collection, and there still is a, sa a sailing festival every Sunday. And it's a marvelous sight to see these huge sails of the hookers, you know, which are very big boats. Yeah. And these boats, the reason there were so many boats was that people used to travel by boat in between the peninsulas to visit their neighbors and to carry goods. And those hookers were the, were the, the lorries of yesterday, yesteryear up to the 50s. And they carried the goods from Galway merchants out to Connemara. And so the boat was the most important aspect of Connemara. It isn't now because everybody has cars and they're commuting to the jobs which are in Galway. But in those days, the boat was the way to travel. Every house had a curragh. Yeah. Everybody built their own house as well. That's not even that long ago. No, it's there not. There was something you said in the documentary. I can't remember exactly, but forgive me. Maybe you'll correct me. Something like, it is said that we hoisted a sail before we saddled a horse. Was that something that you Tor, said? Thor Heyerdahl said that. Thor, the man who said the Atlantic, etc. Uh, he said, a man hoisted the sail before he saddled the horse. And that made absolute sense to me, mainly because the easiest way to travel was by boat, right back for thousands of years. You couldn't travel through Europe in those days, one, because of it's covered in forests, two, it was covered with uh, wild people. And the, the, in fact, the sailors, I think, are really, the, some people would say, <laughs> still are. Uh, <laughs> that's only next to our island. <laughs> But they still, they still, they still travel by boat for pleasure. Now it's a middle-class sport, but by then it was an economic necessity to travel by boat. Uh, what was his name? Raftery. He was the ex-director of the National Museum. I had a long interview with him many years ago. That's Joseph Raftery, is it? Joe Raftery. That's right. Yeah, his son is Barry, who is an archaeologist, I think. But he said to me that Charles Thomas of, of Cornwall had made a study of the difference between traveling overland and traveling by boat in Roman times, and said that it was infinitely cheaper to transport goods by boat than by overland. Overland was a tough place to go. It was pretty wild and dangerous. Whereas the sea, you understood what the danger was, you know, apart from the fire pirates, of course. Yeah, uh, from an Irish perspective, it seems really obvious, doesn't it? I mean, we know from the archaeological record that people have been coming to this island since at least the end of the Ice Age, if they didn't, some of them lived through it. And obviously, all, all almost all evidence of pre-Ice Age activity is gone. It makes sense. I mean, if we were landlocked Russians who had to travel at least a thousand or two thousand miles to get to the nearest sea or ocean, we might not understand. But living on this small island, it makes perfect sense that all of the contact, and of course we know now that uh, that was sort of, that activity was quite prolific in, for instance, the Neolithic when there seems to have been cultural contacts. Con I'm, glad contacts. You're going, I'm glad you're going back that far because that's one thing I want to uh, tell you tonight. The research I did on the Paleolithic, Megalithic, Neolithic periods in this, on this island. Um, there's a, a scientist now with the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg, but in 1999 he was in Potsdam and he and his co colleagues developed a climate model, a computerized climate model, and they combined atmospheric situation, vegetation from ice cores in the, in the Antarctic, uh, which preserved, you know, the CO2 level in them and everything, and cores from the Atlantic off uh, North Africa, and cores from the Sahara. And what they came, the conclusion they came to was that 
6,000 years ago, the Sahara hasn't been there for thousands of years. The Sahara desertification hit the, the Sahara in 6,700 up to 5,300 for the first time and the second time from 4,000 to 3,000. A dreadful desertification. And they worked it out that with these ice cores, because they were able to tell what the vegetation, what the atmosphere was, why this happened. And why did it happen? The earth wobbles on its axis, you know, it wobbles between four, 24 degrees and 23 degrees. In those days, it was 24.14 degrees, and now it's 23.40 degrees. So the earth wobbles, and they put that uh, desertification down to this. Of course, the ice was retreating at this time from 13,000 on, BC on. The ice was retreating, and that produced a hotter climate over the Sahara, North Africa, and it became desertified. Up to that, it was a rich, and, uh, and, and farmers were there, but there were all kinds of animals living there as well, rhinoceros, elephants, gazelles, and they still find the skeletons of them now. But those farmers who were living quite happily, uh, uh, herding cattle and planting wheat, and that didn't come from Turkey. That was it, it, it set up separately in various different places, the agricultural revolution, and it happened in North Africa as well. And there were farmers there for thousands of years until this desertification happened and their livelihoods, the socioeconomic basis of their civilization died. So where did they go? Some say they went to Egypt and founded the pharaoh, pharaonic dynasties. Others must have come up the coasts. Now in North Africa now, you still find the megalithic culture. For instance, years ago, I found a place called the Mzora, which is in a place called Larash, at the head of a silted up river. And a, a man from the Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institute, James W. Mavor, made a survey of this in Zora, which is identical to Newgrange, circle of huge boulders with a pillar stone, which used to be on top of Newgrange. And he said, this is the nearest thing to New Newgrange that you will find. Now this happened at exactly, the desertification happened, and then, a new range happened, and Mzora happened before that. And so that climate change caused those megalithic people to get into their boats and say, hedgehog up the Atlantic coasts. Brittany is a, a prime example of it. You find places like Newgrange in Brittany, it's a wonderful place for, for megalithic uh, culture. And they landed in Ireland. And they are responsible for that megalithic and neolithic culture that spreads all the way to Scandinavia. From North Africa, it came as a result of climate change, and nobody has ever said that before. I, I, I never knew that, and I'm absolutely astonished. And at the nobody same knows. time, I mean, I'm astonished, positively astonished, because, you know, if you look at any map of megalithic Europe, it is a fringe map it's it, the coast. it is the western fringe it is the atlantean coasts i mean if you include malta and goes out yes, in, in the mediterranean um you know all of the shaded areas that we see on any maps of of the 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 uh, megalithic world or civilization whatever you want to call it, it it is all pretty much confined to the coasts of iberia france you know britain and ireland um, you don't have to venture too far inland to get to the centre of either, in fairness, you know, and on up, uh, as you well, say. They, are, they, were they were sailors, these people. These mm. farmers became sailors. And they moved across. They moved. If, have you ever seen a map of Europe in spring? From a satellite picture. And there's a wonderful picture of them, which, which I saw years ago. And you see the greening of Europe happening as the climate changes, as the spring comes. And so that's exactly what happened. It, it, the, now, the, the, the irony of, of course, is that as the climate changed in North Africa, producing the Sahara Desert, in the Northern Hemisphere, it became much more humid and precipitation increased at the same time. And that's why 
uh, there was so much rain that the trees that covered Ireland were drowned, literally drowned. And that's why in my garden, I can find bog oak and gushok, we call it, which is the remnants of those trees that were drowned by this change of climate 4,000, 5,000 years ago. The evidence is still here. And I simply can't understand why scholars have never, ever touched on this. That's really incredible. So what we're seeing is the dramatic, uh, the dramatic effects of climate change mm -hmm. and the migration, the mass movement of peoples. As is happening now. Yeah. I mean, migration from Africa is coming now because of climate change. Mm. So uh, things haven't changed, uh, I suppose. Nothing, nothing changes. In some regards. That's really interesting. I never knew that about the Sahara. You know, nobody knows that. I always would have assumed that the de desertification of the Sahara happened maybe, you know, 50,000 years, 50, 50, years ago or 100,000 years ago. No, it's not quite recently. Um, In geological time, a blink of the eye. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to, because I, I need to backtrack for a second, because the conversation is following a lovely um, uh, river, shall we call it, or uh, tide. A, a tide, yes, a lovely current. But uh, earlier on, when we were, I, I meant to ask you, when we were talking about Valency, um, you also had a soft spot for a, a good friend of mine, Martin Brennan. Yes, I never met him in person. Right. I corresponded with him. When I was studying Newgrange and trying to find out exactly what it was about, and I heard about this man who had camped in Newgrange and he suddenly departed. And I heard that he was deported or something, you know. So I wrote to him, I got his address in Denver, Colorado, and wrote to him and asked him what actually happened. He said, Well, they mistook me for an IRA man. They thought I was reconnoitering Newgrange. And so they said, they didn't deport me, but they said, you better get out of here, baby. You're an American, you're a farmer here, get out. But Martin Brennan, I think, was indeed the first really to study the astronomical signs in Newgrange. Uh, he, he was a terrific man, you know, and of course he was, he, he was got out because he was a stranger. They, they didn't understand what he was at, you know? He, he, he had, he, him and his friends, Jack Roberts, Toby Hall, Hank Harrison and others, they made some very important discoveries. There's mm -hmm. the winter solstice sunset alignment yeah. at South, the equinox alignment at Cairn T. Mm -hmm. You might be pleased to hear, Bob, that um, although I'm not into um, regular contact with Martin, I brought him back to Ireland for the first time in 25 years in 2009 uh, to give a talk at a conference in the Boyne Valley. He currently is ensconced in uh, Mexico, where um, at the grand old age, I think Martin is in his late 70s. Uh, he is still swimming every day and uh, he does martial arts. He does Aikido, etc., etc. Uh, and he's apparently keeping well. I'm, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to speak it to him in, in the near future. Unfortunately, he's not at all connected to technology in any way. Still mm -hmm. writes everything in his lovely cursive script with a pencil and paper. He's very old fashioned in that regard. And anyway, mm -hmm. I thought I should mention that you had a little bit, you had something good to say about his theories in your book. And I thought, yeah, yeah I admired him greatly. Because, because he was the one I associated with these astronomical findings, and the identification of these solstice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Incidentally, he wrote a book. I think he wrote a book. Yes, he did. Oh, he did. He wrote several. Yeah. yeah. And the Boyne Valley Vision and, and the Stones of Time. It was reviewed in, I think, the Irish Times or some Sunday. It excavated and turned Newgrange into a Disneyland. Uh, and she was his widow, and she ripped and tore apart Martin Brennan and that and his book. And I thought, my dad, the world of academia is a bit of a jungle, really, when it gets down to it. There's a lot of savagery in it. Yeah, I think also, in, in fairness, Brennan would probably admit now that he did make some claims uh, that were perhaps stretching things a bit. But overall, he brought light on a, an obscure area of prehistory, and uh, yeah, uh, I suppose uh, I'm, I'm familiar with both. So I wrote about it in my Newgrange book, actually, about mm -hmm. the, the two camps and the archaeologists versus the, you know, the, uh, uh, the amateurs, amateurs, if you want to call yeah. them, you know, and uh, it was, uh, let's just say it, it got vicious at times. And let's mm -hmm. leave it at that. Uh, Bob, your, your exploration of uh, this 
theory and this idea of the connectivity of between Ireland and North Africa wasn't limited to sailing, uh, you know, and the Shanno singing, etc. You saw, for instance, similarities between early Irish manuscripts, such as the Book of, of Duro, and Islamic manuscripts from the Near East. Yes, I investigated these in the Char Chester Beatty Library uh, because I read an article by David James, the late David, David James, who had left in, in bad odor from Chester Beatty, because I think he'd sold some of the manuscripts on the side. But he showed me the connection between the Book of Duro and the, the, the 10th century Koran that he showed me. And he showed me that the patterns were similar, you know. And he believed that there was a connection between them. And I investigated this. Religion comes into this very importantly, you know, apart from Islam, well, not apart from Islam, but the center place, because I discovered that uh, Islam and the Muslims uh, had invented after the Greeks. They translated the Greek findings in, in, in uh, the, the Library of Alexandria into Arabic. And these were all the medical books, the philosophy books, Aristotle, all of these boys, and we owe that to the Muslims because they translated these books and they passed them on to Europe in the 12th century, where they were taken up by the University of Paris. And that's how we got our advanced medicine and our advanced philosophy from the Greeks via the Muslims in North Africa and in the Middle East generally. So that relationship between Islam and uh, and Christianity has fascinated me. And I, I came to the conclusion that the reason we knew so very little about uh, Islam, except that they were all suicide bombers, you know, two billion of them were suicide bombers and women oppressors. That's the impression we've had of until quite recently, was because of the rivalry between Christianity and Islam. Because Christianity was afraid of Islam because it was taking over the whole Middle East. And this was terrible for Christianity because the origins of Christianity were in North Africa. St. Augustine was a Berber. All of the church fathers that are mentioned in the mass at the start, the fathers of the church, they were all North Africans. The Latin church was North African. Uh, until the third century AD, when it became accommodated or made an accommodation with the Roman Empire and took over, Christianized the Roman Empire. But the enemy always was Islam, and that rivalry continued up to this century. And both religions have a lot to answer for, but in the background, the Irish uh, scholars of the eighth, ninth, 10th centuries, where the philosophers were dealing in philosophy, and they were in Charlemagne's court, they were derided by Alcuin, who had Charlemagne's ear, and he told Charlemagne to be aware of these Irish monks with their learning and everything else, because they're too interested in philosophy, whereas he was interested in theology, the letter of the law. The same tension existed in Spain between the, the Muslim philosophers and their established religion as well. So the philosophers are always on the, on the, on the fringe and they're always looked at with suspicion. And the intellectuals and the, and the uh, and the philosophers. I just read the other day, by the way, I'm reading about Morocco and the King Hassan of Morocco. And uh, he said, the, most the greatest danger to a state is the intellectuals. They would be better off all being illiterate. So these were the intellectuals of the church, the, the, the monks in Charlemagne's court and the philosophers in Spain. In the, when the Arabs were in charge of Spain, the south part of Spain for years, 800 years actually. So that aspect of religion has always fascinated me, you know, how religions can become, and start wars really. Yeah, and you took a particular interest too in the Coptic Christians of Egypt, didn't you? Well, I was, I was very interested in them because I'd never heard of the Coptic. I, you must remember that when I started this whole thing 50 years ago, 40 years ago, I was an ignoramus. I knew nothing about anything, which is why I, I took a year off television. I went to Nova Scotia to study the theory of knowledge in the sociology course. But I knew nothing about any of these things. And I had to start from scratch and find out for myself these things. There's no point in reading books. And uh, the, the main thing I learned was that 
All knowledge is relative. All knowledge is relative. There is no absolute truth. It's all versions and interpretations. For instance, uh, one great poet said, Robert Graves, I think he said, it is the duty of scholars to excavate cleanly. Scholars, archeologists, to excavate cleanly, but not to interpret. Leave the interpretation to the poets. I thought that was the wisest thing I'd ever heard. Because you know how archeological findings are all misinterpreted, interpreted, misinterpreted in terms of the politics of the day. You're the Piltdown man in England, you know, for 40 years they thought that proved that the Brits were the first people in the world, you know. And all it was discovered it was a hoax. And so I think the things should be always interpreted by poets rather than the, the very brilliant scholars that examine these matters, you know. And I've picked the brains for the past 40 years and I admire them greatly. Yeah, well, uh, we, we had reason two weeks ago to discuss, uh, you know, uh, the theory of the British Israelites and how they came to believe that the Hill of Tara was going to be the future Jerusalem, mm. you know, and, and, and how some of these ideas were embedded that was J.P. Yeah. Pallery's interview, wasn't it? I saw that. Uh, well, we were talking to Mairead Carew, uh, who has written a book about Tara and the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, mm -hmm. But we did also, we did have a chance to talk to J.P. Mallory as well. And actually, that, funnily enough, that kind of links up with my next question, because in, in the interview with Professor Mallory, we spoke about the Barbary ape skull that was found at Awan Macha. Yeah, I and, handled that in the British Museum years ago. Yes, I, I saw that in, in your film. Um, now, Professor Mallory issues caution around these things because he says, look, that doesn't prove anything other than somebody at some point, you know, either went there or somebody from there came here or we met in the middle and somebody traded an ape, you know. Um, but you were excited about it nonetheless. I elaborated on that to my own advantage because I saw this play in the Abbey by W.B. Yeats and it was Deirdre, I think. And Padalam, the actor, had this line which said, what about these uh, Libyan dragon skins? And I pricked up my ears, what, what Libyan dragon skins in Ireland of the, in the Iron Age, you know? And that's why I investigated the Barbary ape, uh, just to suggest that a Libyan mercenaries, Liberian mercenaries were in Ireland at the time. And why had they come here? I don't know. But one of them had brought this Barbary ape with them. And, uh, well, it was interesting to see that it actually exists, this skull of the Barbary ape in a little box in the British Museum. Yeah. I there are many rabbit holes like that. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, one that's a little bit less tenuous is the connection. I mean, mythologically, we, we hear so much about Iberia and Spain, I mean, the Milesians, etc. You know, Mil España, the soldier of Spain, was supposed to have been the father of all these guys who came and basically seeded Ireland. Uh, with, you know, the generations of people who claim their descent from the Gael. What, what, is, what is the connection with the Spanish arch in Galway? I was particularly interested in that one. Well, that's just a, 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 an indication of the amount of trade there was directly between Spain and Ireland in the last century, in the century, last three centuries. Uh, there was a huge trade, and that's why fosterage happened. Uh, the Irish used foster the children of the people they traded with and vice versa. And in fact, you've heard of Judge Lynch who had his own son hanged. The reason he had his son hanged because the son had killed the young man that the judge himself had fostered from a friend of his in uh, Spain. So the fosterage, it, it was also a form of hostage taking as well because there was huge trade uh, I mean, it was, it was, Galway Bay was full of Spanish ships at one stage, bringing their wine and their etc. to us, and we gave them skins. And there was a huge trade between the two by boat. Oh, oh, of course, all all by the sea lanes, the natural way. Bob, are you aware of? Uh, as a question, I'm just throwing in. Are you aware of, is there some sort of natural current that sweeps up the Bay of Biscay from the north of Spain that if you were to set sail in a boat, it would just naturally take you to Ireland? I haven't, I haven't come across that. I know nothing about tides. No, but it's something I'm, I, I may have read in a book. I do. If, when, if anybody wants to sail to America, they sail straight down the coast to the Azores because there's a, the, the, current there and the winds there take them across the Atlantic. 
So that may be what you're referring to. Something I, I read, and maybe one of our viewers can recall, or maybe they know more than I do, but something I recall about if you set sail from Spain, that there is a current that will naturally take you. And in fact, it doesn't, it takes you around Cornwall and it actually takes you around the west coast of Ireland, uh, something that may feed into all of this. I've never heard of that. No, that's okay. As speaking of uh, the seas and sailing the seas, you know, I've, I've been saying for a long time, it's clear that the Irish were sailing the seas since time immemorial. How the hell did we come here in the first place? One of the things that Professor Mallory says in his book about the origins of the Irish is that it now looks unlikely that there was any land or ice bridge uh, at the end of the Ice Age for people to walk across. So, you know, even as far back as maybe 12,000 years ago, we needed to sail to get here. In the Atlantean Irish, you suggest that when the Vikings reached the Hebrides, the Faroe Islands, and even Iceland, they found that the Irish had been there before them. Tell us more. Yeah, uh, well, there were Irish monks. They found our Irish monks in, in uh, Iceland. Uh, but it all came from uh, St. Brendan's voyage in the fifth century, Navigatio, and, uh, which Tim Severin repeated many years later. But in the fifth century, Brendan is reputed to have uh, sailed up the Faroes, uh, Iceland, and reached the North, uh, Northern America, Canada. Um, now, the interesting thing about that Navigatio is that uh, it refers to various uh, phenomena that he encountered, like the uh, volcanoes, uh, and they thought it was giants firing rocks at their boats, and they came, came across as a sea monster. And the interesting thing is that uh, in the Sinbad the Sailor Arabic tale, exactly the same phenomenon are recorded by Sinbad on his journeys. So somehow or other, there was a, a coalescence between the literary tradition of Irish uh, scholarship, namely the Navigatio, and the writers of the Arabian Nights in which Sinbad features. But it's their identical phenomenon they both encounter, particularly these volcanoes and this Jasconius, the huge whale on which uh, they lit a fire, and it turned out to be a whale. They thought it was an island, and it turned out to be a sea monster. These are, this is in Sinbad's story. But um, St. Brendan's Navigatio refers to exactly the same phenomenon. So it looks like he did sail across the Atlantic, you know, or it was part of the Arabs copied the stories. But I think the Arabian Nights stories were written long before St. Brendan. Yeah. Well, I'm not overly familiar with the Brendan story, but we certainly had an opportunity recently on our live myth series uh, to investigate the story, The Voyage of Mile Dune, which may be, I don't know, perhaps a precursor uh, to the Brendan story. And again, the same sort of idea, uh, sailing out off the West Coast and encountering lots of different, a total of 31 different magical or some way enchanted islands with various mm -hmm. mysterious happenings. So um, I just noticed there, Paul Murphy is asking about uh, questions. I just want to mention that if Bob is able to, to hang around for a few minutes at the end, we certainly will take a few live questions. Uh, and so when, when, we're, when we're reaching the end of the discussion, I'll invite you just to, uh, to put in the chat that you want to ask a question, and perhaps we'll take two or three uh, questions from the audience. Sorry, Bob. Before we finish with St. Brendan, there was Isola Brendani, St. Brendan's Island in the middle of the Atlantic on all of the mocks up to about the 17th century. St. Brendan's Island. And yeah. of course, it doesn't exist at all. No, and High Brazil was marked on many maps around the same time. Yeah. That's right. yes. and, and there's no evidence that it actually ever existed. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. yeah. At the time you published your book, there was a reticence among archaeologists about the idea that Neolithic people were techn technologically equipped to sail long distances. Surely this view has now changed. Well, I, I think so. I mean, the people who came here originally brought cattle with them. No doubt about that. I know J.P. Mallory wasn't sure about this, but I, being an amateur, can say that without doubt. And I'll give you the proof of it. This is a book about... Uh, Paleolithic and Megalithic North Africa, a place called Tassili in southwest Algeria. And I've known about this for a while because 
they were, they were magnificent artists. These are Paleolithic pictures, Paleolithic, Megalithic, and Neolithic pictures and paintings on the rocks in the mountains in southwest Algeria in the middle of the desert. These were obviously made before the desertification of the Sahara, but because of all the cattle and the animals that were there that are painted in this book, in these, on these walls, you know, they're Look at that. So many animals were in the Sahara before desertification happened. And they were painted by these superb artists. Mind you, they couldn't write. So they uh, drew pictures like children. And the, the, the mountains are covered with these magnificent drawings from the Paleographic, which is 6,000, 7,000 years ago. So uh, the human race is, is very old. Oh, absolutely. And uh, art came first. Do you have a, I might as well stick a question in there. Do you have any thoughts, Bob, as to why Irish megalithic art is non-representational non and doesn't feature anthropomorphic or, or animal figures? Um, I don't know, unless they're like the Arabs. That the Arabs don't uh, like representatives of, of human beings in their pictures. In fact, they're forbidden with the Koran. It has to be writing on the coins. It's all writing. There's no pictures of emperors or anything like that. And that's probably a coincidence. And I don't know why our, which, to which particular Irish art are you referring? Uh, well, I'm, I'm talking about passage tomb art in particular. You know, like all the designs. Oh, symbolic, yeah. On you, you know. Well, it's their astronomical a record of their astronomical observations. These, were, these people were brilliant. These are, no such thing as Stone Age people. The people who were operating there and who built Newgrange were most sophisticated people. Mm. They knew everything about the universe and about the astronomy. And they, indeed, they had to know because they were farmers. And so they had to know the changing of the seasons, when they bring the bull to the cow, etc. You know, that's yep. why they studied the stars, you know, and they knew their stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like any I farmer nowadays. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. There's, there's so little between us and them in terms of intellect, the main differences are te technological, you know, and, and how we approach things today, you know. The irony, the irony of course, is that the more that uh, scientists study, astrophysicists study reality in terms of phys particles and everything like that, the more they realize they don't know. I was at CERN there last January, January 12 months before the lockdown, CERN where this accelerator, accelerator is, where they a particle accelerator, yeah. Bash particles together to find the, the, the Higgs boson uh, particle, you know. Uh, I mean, they're spending billions on that. They're trying to find out what happened at the beginning. What is reality? And the more they study these things, the less they find of reality, you know. And you know what? I think the scientists are going to invent a new religion, you know, <laughs> to explain it all. And we start all over again, the cycle. That's quite possible if we don't destroy ourselves in the meantime, uh, which is always, it seems to be always a, a looming possibility. Just go back a little bit to that uh, stone circle that you saw. In, is it Mzara? Is that what you call it? In exactly. Morocco? There was a stone there that was very like the standing stone at Punch's Town. You know, that very yeah. large standing stone. stone. Yes, I know that one. Yeah. Near Nace. Yeah, but there was one on top of Newgrange. That's right. When uh, Lloyd investigated it, and it still ha they still have the stone at Mzora. Now, most of the stones in the circle have been taken away by the local people to build their houses and that sort of thing. And in fact, we had to trudge a few kilometers through the mud to get to this particular village. And uh, it was fascinating, I must say. It was in a, I was in a museum in Meknes studying the Berber jewellery, which is exactly similar to the Tower of Roche. And the curator there asked me, did I know about Mzora? And I said, never heard of it. So she gave me directions and we went there the following day. And uh, I was astonished to see this. Nobody I asked about that in Europe heard about it until I came across an archaeologist in Italy. And he told me, yes, oh yes, Mzora. And he referred me to James W. Mavor's paper. And I read James W. Mavor's, and James W. Mavor from the Oceanographic Institute said, this is certainly from the Bronze Age. I think it was earlier than that, but he said it's from the Bronze, the Atlantic Bronze Age, he, just, he said Emzora was. And he put it down exactly 
to the Atlantean theory. He didn't use the Atlantean theory, but I'm saying he attributed it to this Atlantic impression and uh, invention of, uh, uh, well, realization of the relationship between the Mediterranean and Ireland. Are there many more megalithic sites yes. on, on coastal yes. Africa that you're aware of? All along uh, the Algerian coasts, there are megaliths and dolmens, like there are in Portugal and Spain and Ireland and up to Scandinavia. It's exactly the same culture, you know. Now, you could always say that uh, it's uh, not diffusion at all. Some people do say it's not diffusion at all. It's not diffusion of culture. It's people inventing things at the same time, you know, uh, on their own. I don't know, it's too much of a coincidence that these, this same culture, stone culture, should exist all the way up the uh, western coast of Europe yeah. and nowhere else. I'm just wondering, is there a reason why North Africa would be omitted from the maps? Because we don't recognise Africa except as a place to send Holy Ghost Fathers to convert them to Christianity and yeah. to colonise them. And you can't colonize a country until you first prove that they're savages and barbarians have no history and no civilization until they discovered Zimbabwe and places like that. And they realized there were civilizations in Africa long before while we were in wearing fur. And well, colonization is the reason why we're kept so ignorant of the of yeah. these They do say ultimately, if you trace our origins far back enough, no matter how white your skin and how European you think you are, you can go all the way back and uh, you'll find that your lineage begins somewhere in Africa. Um, I, I don't know why I'm asking, I'm not immediately familiar with why I'm asking you this question, but you took an, inter an interest in the Irish word dura, as in an oak wood, um, yeah. which is found in many Irish place names. What was the particular interest there? Well, here I started planting trees about 25, 30 years ago. They're all immense now, and I have to put them down and carve them into images. But I was very interested in trees to, to counter my uh, carbon dioxide from my car. And so I, then I started thinking about trees and dirre. And I learned that dirre is from dar, which is the Irish for oak, and the name Makdara, which proves how old the name Makdara is. So I noted uh, so many places in Ireland had the dirre or dairy uh, suffix. In fact, I counted over a thousand townlands in Ireland that have the dirre, mm. dirre like dairy, which was originally dirre caldoch, and dirre colocilla. It was changed from dirre caldoch, which was the old name, to dirre colocilla. And I started counting these, and then I said, now that means there must have been trees here. So there were trees, as I've subsequently found is covered in tree until this increased precipitation with the tilt of the earth and the climate change that produced desertification in North Africa. So the place was covered in trees and these trees were literally drowned by the torrential precipitation that came as a result of this moving of the, the uh, ice backwards or, or northwards and the temperature changing. In the Sahara it turns it into desert, up here it turns it into torrential rain all the time, the trees were drowned. And I find the trees in my garden buried under 4,000 years of, 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 of bog. And so I, I started investigating this and I came across one place in uh, near Balana, near Dura. Age of Fields, yeah. Age of Fields, you know? Yeah. And there was a headland there called Derry something, Dura something. And there was not the sign of a tree on it. Yeah. And there was no sign of yusha there at all. So I said, that's strange. Now, why is that? It's called Dira, but there are no, no record of any trees there. And I never wear trees there because it was a uh, headland over the sea and probably salt killed the, the trees, but it's still called Dira. And so I said, that name must be very old. And I investigated. And I discovered that that name Dira is pre-Celtic, pre-Celtic. That's where they use the name Celtic, the word Celtic, means before the Irish language came here. But that particular word convinced me that the Irish language has been here for at least 5,000 years. Not 2,500 years, as we are led to believe, with an invasion of Celts from Europe, which yeah. is an Aryan invention. You know? And so 
uh, Dira, the Irish language has been here for at least 5,000 years. Yeah, well, th that uh, was something that you might remember. I did ask Professor Mallory about if we went back to Newgrange 5,000 years ago when it was being built, would we recognize any of the words? And look, he, he you know, he, in fairness, I was putting him on the spot and, and it's not an easy question to answer. But there you have, um, there's a photo in your book of that headland and it's quite clearly a rocky plateau. As you say, no indication of any substantial vegetation there. And yet uh, there's a memory of uh, there. oak yeah. trees, which, as you say, must be pre-Celtic. And therefore, we're talking probably Bronze Age at the earliest, you know, perhaps three, four thousand years ago. And I would, knows, I, would maybe, five thousand years. I would say that the first settlers here spoke a form of Irish. And the reason I say that is because I met a man named Heinrich Wagner, who was a linguist in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And he produced an atlas of Irish in this country, and he was a well-known specialist in the thing. And he had written an essay about the origins of Irish. And he said that under Irish, like, you know, in uh, here, we speak English, but under the English we speak is Irish, for instance. Uh, I'm after being... I'm after, yeah, I'm after going to the toilet, yeah. <laughs> That's directly from Irish. So under English is this substratum of Irish. Under Irish, there is a substratum of what he called Hamito-Semitic languages, which are Hamito. Hamitic would be the language the pharaohs spoke, and Semitic would be the language the Arabs speak. Hebrew is a Semitic language anyway, and uh, uh, Hamitic would be the language the Berbers speak who are the origins of the Egyptian dynasties. So it's, it's, it's I mean, you're treading her angels fear to go in this yeah, league, yeah. minefield, you know, but Heinrich Wagner was one of the, uh, of the people who encouraged me in this, in fact, a lot of people encouraged me, Henry Blacking of Queen's University, Paddy Henry from UCG, for all the people who discouraged me. In fact, there were very few people who discouraged me, but there were a lot of people who encouraged me to go down this, Rabbit yeah. hole, you know, because scholars have to be careful what they say, because they deal in precedents like medieval law. In medieval, in the law, you have to follow the precedents. You can't plead a case with having precedents. You know, say, oh, in the English law it says this, and we have an English law system here. So, in in the world of world of scholarship, they have to use the precedents. So, the students have to reproduce what their professors teach them, the professors have to follow what their professors taught them. So the same memes are repeated for years and years and years, and it obscures the possibility of adventure in these matters. I mean, it's a, a very exciting, this whole thing. Yeah. That excitement is not conveyed to students nowadays and hasn't been for years. Well, maybe nowadays, I don't know what's happening. I once applied to attend a, uh, the middle of a, an archaeology course in UCG, not many years ago actually, and, and I got a letter back from the director of the archaeology department saying it would not be wise to uh, <laughs> to join in the middle of the course. All I wanted to do was audit the course, sit in and listen to learn something about archaeology. She said it would be pedagogically unsound. And that's a great phrase, isn't it? Now, the irony, of course, is the same university proposes to award me an honoris causa delit this year. So the wheel turns around, you know. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I'm sure. And you've every right to be proud of that. Fantastic. After 40, after 40 years. <laughs> yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, <laughs> fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I suspect that uh, many people who are occupy areas of, shall we say, intrigue or those grey areas, you know, uh, find themselves secretly being urged on by some of the academics who can't say anything. Yes, that's what I... But privately are sort of saying, go on, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and by, the, by the way, I detect something there that you said, uh, you were talking about Wagner, was it Wagner's, you said his name was? Uh, I think Wagner, yeah. You know, it, it appears that we have somehow or somewhat vindicated valency in his stance that perhaps uh, Irish has origins, uh, you know, that make it akin to 
among other things, Hebrew. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll move on, Bob, because I have a few more questions to ask, and then I'm going to throw it out to the audience to ask a few questions. You have some ideas about the origins of the Galway shawl and some patterns on Aaron jumpers in your book, which are interesting. Where might their influences have come from? Well, there's a, there was a man I met who was pretty certain of this. His name was Kiva, and he ran a knitting shop in Oxford, just near the university. And I met him and he said, the patterns of the, he was German, the patterns of the Arben things, uh, designs, so the cross stitch, everything came from the monks, the Irish monks. He was convinced of that. I thought that was fairly valid because he pointed out the designs are basically religious designs. The, uh, I can't remember the Latin name for it, the, Latin, the name for it, but the Caduceus, the Caduceus, which is a Hebrew symbol. And that's on the, on the jumpers as well. I think I featured those in the film. The, the yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I mean, I found all kinds of interesting little details like this, you know, and I used it. And, and are, are they more than just coincidences? I, well, it goes back a long time because first of all, sailors were the first knitters. Sailors knit, used to knit on long voyages. That's right. And they brought that skill of knitting back home with them and got the women to do the knitting from then on, you know. So knitting is a very important link to all of these designs. They had to have a design. There you are, you find all kinds of extraordinary little tidbits when you go into this, into these, into this rabbit hole. Fascinating. Speaking of another tidbit that seems to be relevant to the periods that we're entering, this being St. Patrick's Week, it might shock some people to learn of the meaning of the Arabic word shamrock. S, that's S-H-A-M-R-A-K-H, which is yeah. very similar, isn't it? Actually, similar, all right. You know, Kulik Bay Trefoil, Laurelin, Cairo, Lawan, we may shoes, not sure. Kulik Bay, it was a kind of a glass case, but in it was a trefoil plant. And I asked the man with me, who was Egyptian, I said, what is that? He said, that's a shamrock. I said, a what? He said, this is a shamrock. That's Arabic for trefoil plant. Any trefoil plant is, is a shamrock. Now, where do you go with that? <laughs> the plant that we, St. Patrick was supposed to convert it, the Irish to by saying it represents the Trinity. Everything was Christianized, you know? But the shamrock is an Arabic word. <laughs> is, is that a coincidence or is there, is there a meaningful connection there? It means that we lifted everything from the Muslim world, philosophy, medicine, everything. We got everything from them. Yeah. And of course, I suppose that word was carried by sailors. I'd, I would love for you to go back in time and to interject in the very vehement uh, arguments and discussion that was going on between the British Israelites and the likes of Arthur Griffith and Maud Gaughan at the, at the turn of the 20th century. I'd love to see you stand in there and telling them about your theories and to see how much that would have. Uh, you, well, uh, in fairness, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any of those on because they were inventing a noble lie, as Socrates called it. Each country and people have to invent a noble lie of their origins. And they were, the Conrad Gaelic, the Gaelic League, all of those cultural bodies in the late 19th century, W.B. Yeats and everything, even with you know, this Celtic flowery stuff, they were inventing a noble lie for us. All nations are built on noble lies to say how great they were. I mean, the Brits have gone mad with their noble lie of an empire and ruined themselves now with Brexit. Whereas we have, we are, we are much more conservative. We gradually erode these things and let common sense kind of creep into our politics and our democracy and everything. And we don't, we're not dramatic about it. And we don't have to make huge gestures. They made one huge gesture in this country and that was 1916, you know. And that was the end of our gestures. After that, we became pragmatic, pragmatic. And now we are mass man. 
we are dominated by economics now and we actually don't exist as a, as a country, as a people at all. We exist as internet things, you know. <laughs> I'm glad I'm too old to uh, engage in argument about this or to do anything about it. It sounds no. like there's an entirely Oh, there's another complete episode there in that discussion, I think. <laughs> Too much like hard work. I spent uh, four years on Atlantean and that was enough. Yeah, we've spoke a little bit about your academic friends and perhaps perhaps your enemies too. How was your book received at the time it was published? Well, I'll tell you how it was anticipated by Michael Ryan, who was very helpful to me in the National Museum of Ireland. He let me film the Sheila and the Gigs for the first time, all of the ones in the basement. and. Uh, I told him I was thinking of writing a book about this. He said, Bob, I'll be sitting on your shoulder like Cuhullion's raven to peck your eyes out, if you do. And eventually, actually, he did write. He was the only one who wrote a review of it in uh, the uh, Archaeology Ireland, I think it was. Yeah. And he said, while I disagree with most of what Bob says, I do approve of his adulation for the Muslim contribution to civilization. That at least, because I praised Islam and Muslims, you know. And that's why I was invited to write Gaddafi's biography, because they read this book and they said, oh, he favors Islam and Muslims. I mean, you get him to write a hagiography of Gaddafi. And so I went there for a week and I ran out of it. <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say you did. Has opinion in academic circles changed or moved on since then that's 16 years ago since you published your book and it's 40 years this year isn't it since atlantean aired on tv i think it was 1981 was it no 1984 i apologize so it's not quite 40 it's been many times since so. yeah and people still read the book I, I i got a note from my publisher there recently who published it lilliput press and it showed that 53 people borrowed the book from the public libraries and he said that as many of them bought it and I said, that's amazing, isn't it? After 40 years, people are still interested in that. Yeah. Has the opinion moved on, do you think, in, in the academic We've circle? become more open-minded, you know, and we're more, because we're a bit lost, you know, I think that's why it was quite popular at the time, because we were still, we were beginning to be lost and we were looking for solutions, reasons for our existence, trying to trace who in God's name are we if we are not whom we talk. I, I think it was, it was kind of, uh, it was sort of a reaction against the uh, revisionism that was occurring in this country uh, because we were downplaying all of these Irish characteristics because they were felt to support the provosts in the war in the north. And so um, there was an effort to get away from all of our noble lies. And uh, I think that's why Atlantean caught the imagination of people because they said this is a possible solution a possible explanation for us, you know, and a fairly respectable uh, uh, interpretation of our history. Yeah, well, we've heard, we heard from, again, from Professor Mallory that, uh, you know, there was a time when it was unpopular in Irish archaeology to put uh, substantial material changes down to the arrival of a new people because it had been so fashionable in the early part of the 20th and the late part of the 19th century, it had become so fashionable that it was almost a cliched thing to suggest. And yet uh, they're slowly coming around with DNA science and everything else to realizing that in fact, yeah, we have been visited by waves and waves of incursions and visitors and newcomers over the past five or 10,000 years. So it's just a, a natural progression. One last question from me, Bob, is uh, have you continued your research and have any new discoveries come to light in recent times? Uh, yeah, well, there are things like the papyrus uh, in the cover of a, a, a book here that the story was Egyptian papyrus, you know, it was a very old book. Thing, little things, I keep an eye on these things. I mean, I've only, a, I have an academic interest in it, you know, I, I don't, I'm not deeply involved in it, uh, but I still hold to the general thesis that I, presented, no matter how it is syncretic it is, no matter how off the wall it was, it has a basis in, you know, four years of hard thinking and studying, you know, yeah. and uh, I still would defend it. In fact, that 15 years ago when the book was uh, republished, so it had gone out of print, um, I had to revisit everything again, you know, 
and I added a great deal to the book, you know. But there was yeah. still a lot that I didn't know. I didn't know about the DNA. I just had to quote something from the Trinity people uh, to support the DNA. And, uh, but I only added little bits to it, you know, which I mentioned the uh, desertification of the Sahara, et cetera, but only mentioned it. I didn't know it that well. But that particular thesis, by the way, got the European gold medal for uh, archaeology, I think it was, not archaeology, for something. Uh, for this team of Martin Closens of the Max Planck Institute, European gold medal. That was, they took it seriously, what he said about the desertification of uh, the Sahara at this particular time. But they yeah. didn't, I mean, I just developed it further and said, ah, that's the reason why they would leave North Africa and come up the Western coasts and eventually land in Ireland, bringing their language with them, by the way, their hamito semitic languages with them. Yeah. Their Hamito languages, really. There you are. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, any work that opens up avenues of exploration and asks questions, uh, it deserves uh, some, some audience. And I would certainly say, having read it again recently, I read it a number of years ago, and I read it again from cover to cover recently in advance of our discussion, that uh, certainly uh, one could not consider the Atlantean Irish to be uh, to borrow your own phrase, pedagogically unsound. Um, I'm going to invite, if anybody would like to ask Bob, we might take two or three qu live questions from the audience. If, if you, Rather than putting your hand up, if you would just enter a, a comment in the chat that you'd like to ask a question, we can do that. In the meantime, uh, just briefly, while we're waiting on the few questions, um, I should mention that Return to Segish, I'm expecting from the printer any day now. Uh, it has come back from the bindery uh, and is due uh, for uh, distribution, as it were, anybody who's pre-ordered a copy, uh, I will paste a message in uh, into the chat uh, where you can buy your signed pre-ordered copy. Next week on uh, Live Irish Myths and Conversation, my guest who featured on John Creedon's programme, uh, Creedon's Atlas of Ireland, yesterday evening on uh, RTE1 is Geraldine Stout, the archaeologist, Many of you will be familiar with Geraldine. Uh, she's been excavating in the Boyne Valley uh, for about three decades and uh, has written quite a lot uh, of, that might be of interest to us about mythology and trying to find out the, the identities of the monuments of Brunabonia from the Dunchanicus. The following week, which is the 29th, uh, I'm delighted to say that we will have the prehistory guys on the show. Uh, that is uh, Michael Bott and Rupert Soskin. Um, Okay, so there is a Paul Murphy who may or may not be my father. <laughs> he is. Uh, my, my father would like to ask a question. Uh, John Main is asking, and Una Campbell wants to ask a question. Now, uh, if I ask uh, Paul Murphy, if you would like to ask your question live, can you unmute and ask your question? If not, you can type it in as a comment and we'll read it out. Okay, I've unmuted. There we go. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, Bob. Yep. Bob, uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for sharing your, your uh, knowledge with us. Sure, um, I know it's a long time since you were associated with RTE, and that you had a vision for RTE, which was uh, not connected with uh, commercialism. I'm just wondering, have you any thoughts on RTE as an institution today? Um, well, I listened to the news on uh, Radio Aaron. Uh, I can't listen to anything else because of the interjection of commercial messages um, after every word. It's, uh, and apart from the current affairs programs, it is really now a discotheque and a jukebox. And uh, I feel very sad about what's happened to RTE, our public broadcaster. It is entirely in the hands of advertising interests now, uh, which is a reflection of the state of the world at the moment because we're in global economic, we're part of a global economy and it's horrible, it's a nightmare, it's killing us. But RTE has succumbed to that uh, with the excuse that we have to survive somehow. Um, I think it will die very slowly and uh, an unhappy death before long. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks indeed. Um, uh, we'll move on to John Main. John, would you like to ask your question? 
Hi, Bob, and thank you, um, Anthony, for hosting this. Uh, before I get to, <clears throat> to my question, uh, I'd just like to thank Bob. Um, I saw the original show back in 1940 or 1984, and in my travels, uh, you know, you sparked an interest in me, and I was amazed to see people in the South Sudan worshipping trees and, and the Nuer tribe uh, had, you know, special veneration for their um, wells. And when I traveled in East Africa and I saw the boats and I thought, they're just like Connemara hookers in the East of Africa. And I saw people in Azerbaijan celebrating the spring festival by lighting fires and mm -hmm. jumping over them. And I thought, there's, there's Bob's connectivity uh, all around us. But I was wondering if, um, and you'd mentioned Andalusia and the Muslim connection from southern Spain, and, and I'd studied that myself, and there is definitely, there were links there, and, and as you said about how they saved uh, the Greek philosophers and mathematics and astronomy was, was incredible. If they hadn't done that, all that would have been lost. But I'm wondering, um, I seem to remember you or somebody saying some connection between uh, Andalusia and the round towers in Ireland. Um, or do you have any any theories or any thoughts on the Round Towers and where they came from? No, uh, I, I haven't studied the Round Towers very much. I, I know that uh, Valancey, uh, in one of his more fatuous comments, uh, said they were related to um, Eastern fire places. Not fire places, but fire warning places. That's the only thing I recollect about them. And apart from Ledwich saying that the uh, towers were built by Danes in the ninth century, um, another fatuous comment. So I really don't know anything about them. I certainly, I've never been to And Andalusia. I've been to Spain, all right, but not to Andalusia. Uh, I've listened to the music of Andalusia, indeed. And of course, the Arab Arabic uh, music has influenced the Spanish music tremendously. The flamenco is purely in. Uh, originally an Arabic dance, uh, which I filmed many years ago. Uh, but I'm sorry, I don't know more about the round towers. I mean, they were uh, warning towers, presumably, but they were built as, as, uh, as, as, uh, as towers, bell towers, I thought. But they were there during the Viking times, which accounts for the high uh, first entrance uh, so that they could pull up the ladders and the Vikings couldn't get up to, to the monks. It may have been refuges for the, for, the, for the monks fleeing from the Vikings from the ninth century. No, no, that wasn't true, that that wasn't, that, that was what we were taught, but I'd heard someone else um, saying that it wasn't true, but I, I don't didn't know. hear what the actual you know, reason was. The lookout tower seems seems pretty, you know, pretty obvious, a pretty good, a good, good idea for the, you know, get the good vision for the sea. Thank you for your comment. No problem. George yeah. Petrie was the one, I think, who first suggested that they were actually Irish and they were from monastic times. Cloigchock uh, bell towers or bell houses is what they're called in Irish. Uh, Una Campbell is next. Uh, Bob, I must add at least one person to the list of questions. That's Colette Kavanagh, because she says she knows you. Uh, Una Campbell, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Um, hi, Una from Donegal. How are we all doing? Hi, Una. <laughs> Good. Bob, it's an absolute pleasure um, listening to all of that. And I, I'm sort of thinking the sort of parallel uh, way in that um, your work would have been received uh, all those years ago, um, the scepticism uh, at that lateral scholarly approach, uh, and maybe even, you know, the like of what Martin Brennan received too. Um, but I'm thinking of late, there's a, and I think you would agree too, Anthony, there's a growing uh, awareness that our Din Shanahas and our legends are massively important. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that they're not fanciful. And we can think of them parallel to the academic um, disciplines of study. And I just, just to throw in a fanciful notion recently, Scotta. Have you any views on Scotta and Egypt? Scotta. 
Hmm. Yeah, well, Scota is the original name for Ireland. Yeah. Um, I don't know any connection between, I, well, I've never connected the word Scota with Egypt at all. Uh, nothing has occurred to me about it. Mm. But about that uh, Din Chanachus. Yeah. It, it, I always think that uh, before writing was invented, how did people communicate? They communicated verbally. And I consider the verbal uh, tradition, which would be in Shanachus, to be real history, because it would be the history and the accounts of things that happened, much embellished, admittedly, uh, by the actual actors in it, the ordinary people. And so I have a great respect for the, for the oral tradition as distinct from the written tradition, because the written tradition is, is, is very, very dodgy because it tends to be influenced by the political atmosphere and, and climate at the time, as is most scholarship and most art, by the way. It tends to reflect the economic, uh, and social and political realities or expressions of the time in which they're issued. Whereas oral, oral history is, terribly important because it's personal history and it's what people actually experienced, much embellished, imagine, because they were great storytellers. So uh, up with uh, oral history and Din Shana all the time. Yeah, I agree. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Una. Um, uh, just two quick questions. Um, Carmel O'Dwyer was asking, Bob, could you repeat the name of the book that had the desert rock drawings in it? Oh, it's a French title. I don't speak. Uh, I don't speak very well or write, read very well, but I'm plowing through this. Vers d'autres tasselis. Just hold it up a little bit further for us. Ah, there we go. Brilliant. Hopefully that helps, Carmel. Thanks, Bob and Owen. It was written by Henri Lot. Henri L H O T E Lot. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Alwyn Badzek was just asking if, can you converse with the Berbers? Aha, very good question. Uh, when I was uh, discussing these things with Heinrich Wagner and he was saying there's a Hamitomisemitic uh, substratum in the Irish language. And I asked him, if I was there, would I be able to understand Berber? Uh, and he just laughed and he said, no, 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 no. It's thousands of years since they were related. It's a bit like Welsh. You know, Welsh and Irish were the same language a thousand years ago, but if you go to Wales now, you won't understand what they're saying and they won't understand what you're saying. So the same with the Berbers. I was very optimistic. I thought I might find somebody who was speaking Irish in North Africa. Oh, well. Brilliant. Thanks for the question, Alwyn. Um, Colette Kavna, would you like to unmute? Uh, Colette would like to have a very brief... Uh, would She'd like to say hello anyway. Hi, Bob. Uh... We Hello, Colette. How are you? My goodness, I thought you were in California. I, I sometimes am, but now with uh, with uh, Corona, I'm in Amsterdam. My goodness. I've been here since last June, and I'm not sure whether I'm coming or going back. Uh, it's it's great to find one of my and old friends wonderful. still you're alive. Wonderful. <laughs> enjoyed your talk. You and look I'm younger than ever. Remembering the... Uh, documentaries we worked on together. Indeed, I do, indeed and, I do. Uh, oh. We went off to Nova Scotia and I had to hold the four twice you were gone. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's the year I spent in Nova yeah, Scotia. Yeah. Anyway, it's great to see you and look, see you looking so well. Yeah. Yeah, you too, mind yourself. Yeah. You see, I'll see you again sometime yeah. place in the world, okay. sometime. Yeah. Okay. Mind yourself, bye. Well, but, but would you have, would you be willing to answer one or two more? Sure. Yeah, uh, Tomas, I, uh, Tomas, Tomas, if forgive my pronunciation. De Waldrahe. De Waldrahe. De Waldrahe. De Waldrahe. Uh, Tomas, do, you, do you want to ask your question? Uh, can you hear me, Bob? I can. Tell me on who will push the dog my. Come on, we'll push the dog's stroll. Tell me, I'm stuck in Sydney. Tell me, it's a Sydney. Sydney. Oh, no right. travelling this, no travelling this year. I was great yeah. to hear you again. And... Just to remind you, myself and my brother Porik, we were in the first part of Atlantean sailing into Tierney Pier in the Puka. Do you remember that? That's a long time ago for me to know. A long time ago. How is Porik? 
He's grand, he's grand. You're keeping well, fair play to you. I'm keeping anything I can lay my hands on. Good on you. <laughs> like a Welshman. <laughs> Good on you, the Mahogan. That's Lord. Lord. That's Lord. Oh, uh, Lord. Um, Corey Conway asks, did Bob know Tim Robinson? And what was the greatest legacy of his work? Yes, I did know Tim. I used to call out to his soirees every summer, well, most summers, anyway, to watch the hookers from his balcony. Oh, he was a, he was a wonderful scholar. And uh, I was greatly admirous of him. And the work he did, uh, with his brilliant cartography in Arran and in Clare and then in Connemara and listing all the places. Mind you, he listed 25 dirras in his writings. And I went out and I found 25 more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I met him. He was a very brilliant painter as well. He showed me his paintings. Well, it's sad to hear about him and his wife, Maraid, wasn't it? They died in London there in the last couple of years. No, a brilliant, a beautiful writer, I must say, to write about the landscape as he did was superb. Brilliant stuff. Uh, I have a question, believe it or not, that has arrived on email from a Robert Murphy. What does Bob think of the Atlantis Ireland theory? That is, Ulf Erlingson, I think in 2004, proposed that Ireland was, in fact, from a geographer's perspective, uh, the closest match to um, Plato's uh, Atlantis. Mm. Yeah, well, the Atlantis uh, theory has been like an albatross around my neck. Um, people still call my work Atlantis. Um, I think it's, um, I think it's a lovely myth, lovely myth. Uh, Plato's, uh, was it Plato, yeah? And uh, the, 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 the odd thing is that it's located or purported to be located on the great gulf in the middle of the Atlantic and sunk down beneath the waves. Uh, that was the only practical thing I heard about it. Otherwise, I mean, a lot of people believed that the Irish had come from Atlantis. Uh, as I say, it was an albatross around my neck that, that there was slight confusion between what I was saying and this uh, whole theory. Actually, the man who invented that really, it was a man named Donnelly in America. I think he was Maybe a British Donnelly. What? Was it Ignatius Donnelly? Ignatius Donnelly, I think Donnelly, it was. Yeah. Yes. He, he was a great pursuer of that idea, yeah. Um, I must say I dismissed it and dismiss it, as people would dismiss my work and I'm entitled to dismiss it. But I like the myth, I do. I like the myth. And it's a metaphor, really. And I like metaphors. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I think that wraps up our questions, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Bob, thank you for giving us uh, so much of your time. It's been a long uh, term ambition of mine to get chatting to you in some form. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, that uh, you've given us, as I say, your valuable time uh, this Good evening. Pleasure. And thank you for your intelligent questions. Uh, from my own point of view, I should say that uh, 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 last September, uh, uh, just a brief anecdote, last September my, uh, I was get, getting a tour of Carrow Moor, the megalithic complex in Sligo, by a very good long-time friend of mine, Martin Byrne, and Martin is now an OPW guide, uh, but very much a, a, an independent researcher and scholar, and uh, we got talking to a couple from Northern Ireland, and uh, after a little while, the, the, the gentleman of the couple suddenly sort of sort of, you know, sat up and folded his arms and said, do you know, I'm really glad that I, you know, of all days I arrived, that I arrived on the day when you two were here, because it's clear from talking to you is that you're two mavericks. <laughs> it was the first time I'd ever been described as a maverick. Uh, would, would, do you think that would be a, fi a fitting uh, appellation? Uh, is that something that you would consider a compliment or... Uh, a disgrace to be called a maverick. Well, I've been flattered to be called a maverick many times. And in fact, I named one of my books Maverick uh, to acknowledge this accolade. I think it's very flattering to be called a maverick. A maverick is a, an animal that has not been branded. And that's the definition of a maverick. Yeah. So I think you should feel flattered. Well, if I could wrap up by saying that I think tonight's conversation has been very pedagogically sound. Uh, I've learned a lot, uh, and I think, and I hope, that's the most questions we've ever had in one of these episodes, by the way. I think that's an indication. 
Uh, all that remains for me to do is to thank you again, Bob, for, for, your, uh, for agreeing to do this. Uh, and if you don't mind me telling everybody that uh, this is your first official meeting on Zoom uh, and uh, you're uh, dealing with it very wonderfully, I have to say, coping magnificently. Um, and if I could encourage you, um, I'd certainly love to see more work from your pen um, if, if that is uh, the sort of thing that you consider yourself inclined to do in the near future. Uh, in the meantime, just to remind people that uh, the series continues next Monday with Geraldine Stout and the following Monday with the Prehistory Guys. I'm hoping that we'll run it every week for the next year or so, all going well, if I can find enough, as Professor Mallory describes them, victims. Uh, mm -hmm. Bob, thank you very much. Uh, what I normally do at this stage is just ask everybody to unmute and say good night. Unmute. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Bob. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bob. See you again. Good night. Bye. 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 Good night. <laughs> <Yeah. Yay. Monday. laughs> <laughs>